That was impressive. Thank you, good night, everyone. We appreciate you doing it. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, do you get that a lot when you? <laughs> um, that was some great enthusiasm, actually. Yeah. Uh, I think that's the first time my son saw it in this setting, so. And your son, your son is here tonight. He doesn't think dad is that cool. Uh, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just regular to him. So hopefully that has its, its effects in a good way. Um, well, obviously there's a lot of people here who do think you're that cool. And, uh, and uh, I mean, I, I want to start with, <laughs> thanks, whoever said that. <laughs> Um, I want to start with the most recent stuff, which is, uh, you know, this, this last year, this championship. Yes. Run. And uh, first of all, how are you feeling now a few weeks out from the way everything went there? Oh. What does it feel like at this point? I mean, to be honest, um, it was a little bit of a relief with so much that was going on mm -hmm. in terms of just guys just falling apart. Um, uh, it just wasn't in the, it wasn't aligned with what was supposed to happen. You know, right. everything happens for a reason. I feel like everything happens the way it's supposed to and it just wasn't for us. And um, I'm just hoping, I think everyone is right. at peace because we gave it our all, we gave our maximum effort. And sometimes that's what it's about. You know, the, the effort and energy you put forth. <laughs> Some, sometimes that's what it's all about. You have to reflect and say, hey, that's the best we could do. Uh, just work out, didn't work out for us, and you have to congratulate the other team and say, job well done and congratulations, and um, you look forward to rest, because um, we've been doing this for like a long time. I don't think, I mean, there hasn't been a team since um, the Celtics in like the 60s or 50s to make this many runs at it uh, consecutively. So um, I think I heard um, Aisha saying, uh, there's a lot of nine irons and drivers and, uh, <laughs> It's good to take a step away and, you know, come back ready with that uh, competitive edge when it's time to get back on the court. You know, this is an interesting thing. You bring up this idea of to, to, ha to be at peace after a loss. Mm -hmm. And so much of what we're told about what it takes to be a great athlete has to do with this uh, hyper-competitivism, right? Yes. Refusal to lose. You, you, it's never good enough. You're always there. It's all you mm -hmm. ever care about is. And I wonder how you as an athlete balance that competitiveness, which I assume you have, which is why you're here. Right. How, right. Do you, how do you find, how do you sort of like find that drive and also be at peace? How do those things work together for you? Well, I think we're just competitors in nature. And I think when you, you look at the top of the food chain in terms of professional sports and the one in, I don't know what that number is, one in 10 million, 20 million, whatever it is uh, of professional athletes, um, I think we try to set ourselves apart in terms of our uh, competitive drive. And you, whatever we do, we're really competitive. Um, I always joke with my son. I say, um, you know, he, he, doesn't, he didn't have to grow up in the environment that I grew up in, in terms of you were forced to have that hunger, you were forced to have that grit. But he has a competitive edge and he hates to lose. He gets so frustrated. I mean, He's hitting the ball well on the range today. He had one bad shot, and he just falls apart. <laughs> but at the same time, like, that's, that's it. Yeah. Like, you get it. Like, when I was younger, I was a sore loser. Like, it was so bad. Like, I cried and, like, losing anything. Like, I cried when I won. I lost, like, a math challenge. Like, it was just math challenge. <laughs> but looking back, I'm like, that's it. Yeah. Like, when you, you can't accept losing, you know, and that drives you to uh, – extend yourself um, when you're tired or uh, when you've gone four or five days in a row and two a days, like, then that's when you're able to get that discipline to drive yourself and have that hunger to get better and better. Was there a point at which you felt like you learned how to lose or a series of points at which you, you, you look back and go, okay, that's, that's when I learned how to do this gracefully? Oh, it, that's a good question. Yeah, I don't think I ever learned. <laughs> <laughs> Just recently, probably. <laughs> but I think it's when, you know when I really learned it? When I was in Philadelphia, uh -huh. and there was a lot of expectations, and we had to, you know, they don't accept anything except winning. But when, I, when, when it was all said and done, I had to reflect a few times. I said, 
I didn't reflect on it until after I was gone already. So, I mean, when we were talking about the book, yeah. I, I always say it was kind of thera therapeutic for me because I said, you know, I, always, I felt like I was failing in Philadelphia when we didn't win as, as much as, you know, everyone would like for us to. But when I was reflecting on it, I said, hey, if you feel like our roster yeah. and you look at the talent that we had, the youth we had, we had a lot of young guys. That was the best. We, we exceeded expectations. Yeah. And sometimes in sports, as you just touched upon it, you know, you're taught if you don't win, you fail. But in actuality, is if you've maximized yourself, you gave, you put forth your best effort. Only you know that. Um, but if and I was been in the basketball for so long, you kind of I, I can sense it now. I'm like, okay, this is the the ceiling for that for that team. This is the ceiling for that team. Some are higher than others, and uh, we exceeded expectations in many years in Philadelphia. So now I appreciate it, and even the guys on that team. We, we have these special bonds, and we all know it, but um, it's tough in sports to know that why you're in it in that present moment. It's always like you have to reflect and, and, and really understand it. Yeah, I, would have, I also want to talk a little bit about that sense of reflection. I mean, the, the Warriors run, which you've been a part of, I mean, it, it kind of coincides with your arrival here. Mm -hmm. um, and for those of us who are long, long-suffering Warriors fans, there's a reason they call us <laughs> long-suffering. And um, what was so just tremendous to me to watch, uh, I tweeted this the other day, like people always talk about bandwagon fans, but it seemed to me the Warriors had a lot of bandwagon haters. Uh, like yes. people that just out of yes. no, like in 2012 yes. had no opinion about the Warriors. Yes. Now, 2016, all of a sudden the Warriors, like they hate them and they want them to lose all the time. And I wanted, like, just what was your experience for sort of being that, going through that whole run? Well, it was, it's, it's, it's always, you talk about the roller coaster ride and, uh, the NBA season or the NBA, your lifespan is a roller coaster ride from the ups and downs because there's so many games. So you can be playing a peak one night and then you just bottom out the next. So it's all about the ebbs and flows and how you can balance it all out. And that was interesting in terms of our fanfare. Um, the Bay Area has always had a strong fan base. Even when the team wasn't doing so well, like Oracle was always a great environment. And a lot of people don't realize that. Um, so when we're doing well and we win our first one and Steph's the darling and, you know, he, to, in their eyes he can do no wrong and they can't wait to see him come on the road and we're selling out the, every road game to where the villains, that was like a two-month thing. Like, <laughs> you went from one extreme to the other in like 60 days and nothing occurred with any of the players. You know, we were still the same. So... That was interesting to go through, um, although... Uh, what do you think that is? I mean, having been around and watched a lot of, and just watched fans' reactions, what do you think, I don't want you to speculate too much in fan psychology, right. but what do you think makes that happen for people where they suddenly start hating a team? I think that's the newness of sports, mm. um, especially with the 24-hour news cycle, and there's, it's, it's like a reality show. Right. Um, right kind of vibe to it like it sits on the side and then that's the NBA's marketing machine right. so the NBA does you know we're at the forefront of so many different things whether it be forefront of uh, race relations or uh, how we handle our political issues or in the tech space um, or the relationship between the commissioner and um, our union head or the uh, relationship between our owners and the players they just recently changed the name of the majority stakeholders from owner to governor. Mm. So we're always at the forefront of things. But the NBA has this thing where it's this continuous news cycle, like it's yearly. So it starts with the season and training camp and everyone's excited and who's going to championship and then they can kind of run it into right around the season starting off, tip, tip off and you got a couple of marquee games and that goes into Christmas. Christmas Day is this big celebration and then you got a few uh, marquee matchups in there and then who's doing really well and you're watching them and who's doing really bad and who's underachieving and then that, that ride that wave into all-star break and all-star breaks a huge event yeah. and then you come on an all-star break and there's a little halt but then you talk about the playoff push yeah. and then that playoff push is really and then you go into the trade deadline before yeah. the playoff push so the trade deadline is mm -hmm. a huge thing now yeah. then you go into the playoff push <laughs> then you go into the finals yeah the day after the finals is who's going to be number one pick. Yeah. And then you run into the draft. And then free agency. Now, now the draft's over if you got free agency. And then 
free agency is as crazy as the life of itself now, and then that runs into summer league. Right. Then the summer league gets over, and <laughs> <laughs> it's another it's a cycle all over again. <laughs> so they do a really good job of marketing the game, but that keeps everyone engaged. But I try to talk about it in in a, in, a, in a market sense where you can be overexposed at times, and I hope the game never gets in that place where it's overexposed. Yeah. And, People can get too tired of it. Could talk about it. Somebody mentioned it about football. Um, you don't want a Friday or Saturday game. I think Mark Cuban said it. It was like football was like it was Sunday was that day. Yeah. And now they have Monday, and then yeah. they have Thursday, yeah. and then they have Saturdays in the playoffs. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it can be too much. So yeah. hopefully we can find that sweet spot where there isn't too much talk. Because when you got too much talk, right. you got to find people to talk to or, or people that have something to say, and then you have. <laughs> Uh, voices yeah. that should be in the game that are in the game. And I think some voices that are in the game, they are, they're bringing some stuff that uh, doesn't reflect uh, how we want the game to be seen. And I think that's where a lot of the noise comes from. Yeah, and I also wonder too, <laughs> I also wonder too, and, like, and right now you're like in the middle of this, I mean, I, I, I sit at home and marvel over the way that the, the press cycle works whenever anyone is selling anything, they're selling a book right. or whatever. They go out to do the appearances, they say the things, 40 minute interview, they say half of a sentence, everyone's like, what, they said that? Right. And then all of it, social media thinks that they just went up, like got on a platform and just like yelled that through a me megaphone. Right. And then the whole story becomes about everyone's reaction to that and people writing think pieces about that. And I wonder if you feel like the league is doing a good enough job or whoever is doing a good enough job in preparing young players to understand how that works. Well, I think the best, um, lessons are through experience. Yeah. So, luckily, we didn't have social media. We didn't have Twitter. Um, thank God we didn't. Where we just couldn't do like crazy because they're they're going back and finding guys' Twitters from when they were eight years old and some of the things they were saying. <laughs> it's like, and then a, a lot of guys were saying some things about LeBron. Now there's teammates. You know, it's like it's crazy. It's crazy how that's working. So, uh, I was just fortunate enough to be in that, that sweet spot where I, I was around before and then I got, at the, I was in, right around the middle when everything started to come out so I can kind of tailor things a little bit better and not uh, expose myself too much. Um, but that's just become the nature of it and what clickbait means. Yeah. And everyone's trying to leverage themselves to get to be the next Stephen A. Smith mm -hmm. or Max Kellerman or mm -hmm. Shannon Sharp mm -hmm. or um, anyone else who's got a platform to talk about sports and the new platform is to be loud. And uh, mm -hmm. Jermaine O'Neal had, he, he had one of the best uh, arguing points I've ever heard. He said, just because you're loud doesn't mean you're right. <laughs> he was talking to a teammate. So that was always funny to me. <laughs> but our, you know, um, that's why a lot of the valuations of our, of our teams, of, of, of the league is going up and up because there's so many eyeballs and the more eyeballs and the more with social media, uh, everyone wants to feel a part of it. And like, I'll talk about that balance. When you first get in the league, you know, you, you want to represent the NBA. You yeah. know, uh, we want you to show the fans, get the fans, get a close, up close and personal with you, you know, tweet yeah. and, you know, show your stories on Instagram. But at the same time, you forget um, we're in a very blessed situation and you got a lot that that are, there's jealousy and envy that comes in there and there's a lot of pressure and, and mm -hmm. a lot of negative feedback that, that we see because mm -hmm. we have been told to get close to our fans. So, like I said, you gotta have that balance to where you're not overdoing it and you're not overexposing yourself to a lot of things that come with that, neg the negativity from the social media side. That seems such a tricky balance and I remember, you know, when we were talking about your years in Philadelphia, you told me that Alan Iverson told you not to read the newspaper. Mm -hmm which was a new thing for you because you had grown up reading right. the newspaper. That was like right. kind of one of your main things. But this idea that like if a, if, if a player read the paper and the pa pa paper was like, well, this guy can't shoot, this guy can't ball handle, this guy keeps turning it over, then they would start to play in reaction to that rap that they would get, the knock on them, and it would mess up a guy's game. And it seems to me that not only was that true then, but that's, if that's true then, that's gotta be a million times more true now. Right. Are guys checking, and you don't have to name any names, but are guys checking Twitter well, there at was, halftime? Are people looking at Instagram? Or like, what's there, was <laughs> a, there was an article about it, and this was a couple years ago. Like, this was a couple years ago. Um, 
a player was like, it's normal for guys to check their phones at halftime now. And that was just league-wide. Right. And when I first came in the league, it was like, what are you doing? Right. And then I started seeing it, I'm like, what are y'all doing? Put your phone down. <laughs> but now I even catch myself doing it, just grab my phone. Right. And then for me, if I'm too excited or if I don't have the energy, uh, I'll know to grab like a quick, um, a, a little quick brain game mm -hmm. to kind of lock myself in. Like, all right, let's lock, lock, get locked and loaded. Or I'll read something from uh, Headspace app. You mm -hmm. know, they usually have different quotes on how you can be at calm or and be in the present. So mm -hmm. um, some guys it helps, some guys it doesn't help. But that was, big, that was a big thing a couple of years ago. Um, it was a big article about that was like that, you know, you just naturally go, as soon as you sit down, you grab your phone. Right. Because you're waiting on coaches to come back. But um, there are negative effects, I feel like, when you're trying. Because now we're not playing basketball because we love it. We're playing basketball to prove someone wrong. And we're just checking mm -hmm. to see, like, okay, like you said, someone says, well, he's shooting bad. So now you're, you're thinking about that. And you're not just going out there shooting. You're shooting to prove someone else wrong instead of shooting to help your team win. Yeah, well, that brings me to another question I want to I talk a little bit about. Because I know we have some, some young athletes here. I want to go back to this thing about, about the feeling of winning and losing and how you how you find balance in that. And you, know, you said you felt um, at peace about this loss because you know that you put everything out, the one that happened. Did you feel the same way uh, three years ago when you guys lost in game seven? Oh. Um, did that feel different? Like, how was that? Like, that one was different. I was a different upset with that one. Right. Just the way I, I was upset about how it, how it happened, you know, how everything right. flowed throughout the series from game to game and the different dynamics that happened throughout that series. Uh, that bothered me on a different level. So. Uh, I've learned this week to keep some things to myself. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> no, I was, I was just upset. I wasn't like, yeah. I don't look back and say, um, I don't look back and say, you know, we should have won or this yeah. happened to me, that's not right. I just look at it as a learning experience going forward. Uh, I will say, like, people, I get a lot of, uh, whenever people are mad at me, uh, they put the uh, block by James on all my, uh, my storylines. <laughs> <laughs> what, what people don't understand is that I'm like, I like, I like basketball. I'm a huge basketball fan. Like, I thought that would play. When it happened, I was like, yo, that was one of the greatest things I've ever seen. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so you, you respect the game. You respect great players. And uh, the way Kyrie Irving played that series, I think I did an interview on the Breakfast Club after that. I was like, yo, Kyrie is amazing. Like, yeah. Kyrie is an amazing talent. But... What I do get frustrated in is, you know, they don't want us to express our, our admiration for our peers and mm -hmm. guys we go up against. Like, every time I play against anybody, like, I want to win and I want to, mm -hmm. like, I want to destroy them. But at the same time, you know, I respect these guys in their game. Like, yo, these, these are some amazing players and mm -hmm. a lot of guys that have gone through some stuff that none of us can imagine. And uh, for them to be here is a blessing. And, you know, you're just happy for people that, you know, look like you to have success as well. When you take... <laughs> when you um, take home that feeling of being upset about the way things go and it's over and you can't turn, turn back the clock and you can't fix it, how do you recover from that? Like, what is your method for recovering from that? Well, I mean, whether things are going good or bad, I, I have one thing I do, I just golf. Uh. So, <laughs> so things are going really good. Um, I'm like, cool, I'm about to go shoot par. And then yeah. if things are going really bad, Sam's going to work on my game. And then, because well, when you're playing golf, you, it's so hard. Imagine doing something so hard, you can't think about anything else. Because <laughs> if you do, you're going to be really bad. Mm. So um, I just found that, that place of peace for me. Mm. And um, it's, it's really changed you know, how I move on a daily basis or how I think about things. Because that game is so hard that you can apply it to anything that you do. Mm. You know, I always, uh, I told Bob Myers today, um, and if you want some clickbait, here you go. I told Bob, <laughs> <laughs> I told Bob Myers today, I said, um, I just need to play golf with you two times. It doesn't matter who you are. If I play golf with you two rounds, I figure you out. Yeah. If you're a good person, <laughs> if you're a bad person, if you're a cheater, <laughs> if you're a sore loser, uh, it's really hard to find good company in golf. Yeah. It's really hard. And when you find, if you find yourself like, yo, I really enjoy playing with you, like, that's a good person. Yeah. Like, that's how I found out uh, how I find my friends. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> love that. You know, it seems that I, I, I was looking, in prepping for this, I was looking over some old footage of the team from 2015, 2016. Uh, it seems to me that there was something special about the way that you guys regarded each other, the respect you had mm -hmm. for each other. That's what it felt like from the outside. Did it feel that way for, for you? What did you think made those teams so much better than the, the rest of the league, at least at that time? Um, yeah, well, I think you just, the stars were really aligned. I keep saying it's like the stars were aligned. Mm. And when you look at how our team was built um, from two kids who had parents that played in the NBA, uh, with Steph and Clay, and they're not phased by the fame, and it's like just normal to them, you know, so that they, they don't overreact to any situation that, that comes from around the game. And you look at an underdog like Draymond, who um, second round pick was overlooked because of his size and how he was a great balance with his demeanor and his personality from someone like Steph. And then perfect timing with me being able to come in with Steph having a, an ankle issue early on. Um, and then, you know, with the way Mark Jackson did things with coaching them from, from coaching philosophy and then from Steve Kerr. Steve Kerr coming in at a perfect time because he and I went to the same college. We had the same basketball philosophy. So I was able to adjust to a new Rose very easily, very smoothly because I could understand what he was trying to do. And that, building that environment in that short period of time. And when you build that environment, I say, I talk about Steph all the time because he, you know, he's at the forefront of it. When you have a superstar who's so humble and so normal, it's easy to come in and enjoy work. You know, you don't have a, most superstars, they complain or moan about, you know, practice is too long or I don't want to, I, I play, I scored 35 last night, I don't have to practice today. You know, he's the total opposite. You know, he says, go to work, let's maximize our talents. And he set that tone early on. And then other guys start seeing it when we're going up against them. You know, that's what I saw going up against Steph and going up against Clay is these guys are just enjoying playing basketball. Like they don't, they're not thinking about anything else. They're not thinking about themselves. They're mm -hmm. not thinking about endorsement deals. All they're thinking about is I'm gonna go out and just shoot the ball tonight and watch yeah. it go through the hoop. Yeah. And <laughs> that's, a, that's a beautiful feeling. So other guys see it as well. And we're able to, uh, we're able to add the most talented player of our generation in Kevin Durant and Beautiful things just continue to happen on a higher level, and uh, it's just been a great run so far, and we look forward to continuing the run. Yeah. Um, I, it's, I was watching also um, the final series uh, recently, and I was thinking about the great shooters and what happens when they go through slumps. Mm -hmm. And shooting is so mysterious to me because how do people do that is basically my question, <laughs> right? And, uh, and when someone is amazing at it and you watch them when they're hot, it seems like they can't ever miss. Right. And they're, they're making these insane shots. And then there are times when you watch people go through these slumps. And I wonder just from your own experience shooting and playing the game and being around a lot of players, and also specifically seeing Steph and Clay, what, is, what do they go through in those times when they go you know, two for 14? Does it get in their head? And also flip, on the flip side, what is it like for someone like Clay when he, he He's 37 and a quarter, like, right. what do you see? Well, seeing a miss, um, it doesn't affect us the way it f f affects other people. Mm. Because, well, they, they, those two have, like, it's more so Clay, he has this awesome mentality where he, he forgets what happened like two seconds ago. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> so um, that, that is an amazing skill. <laughs> I wish I had. <laughs> so I talk, to, um, I talk to Steve Kerr about it all the time, and I have the opposite problem. Yeah. I, I can't, I remember something that happened two years ago. <laughs> so it's the, something stuck in my head, and, and you know, like, it's like playing golf. I always tell, you know, whether it's my son or anybody I'm playing with, like, just focus on the ball. And then today my son looked up at me and started laughing, and he tried to swing, he missed the ball. <laughs> because he's thinking about something else where all Clay is thinking about is the next time I touch the ball is going in the hole. Yeah. So he doesn't know he's two for 14. <laughs> <laughs> so that, I think that's the first step in, if you're two for 14, how do you keep, how do you get out of the slump? You don't know you're in a slump. <laughs> so like, like, but seriously, that is an amazing trait to have. But I will, I will add to that 
if Clay is in a slump, I know he's in a slump. Like Draymond and I, we're aware of like we're hyper aware of certain mm. things. We're still looking for him. Right. We're looking for him and Steph more right. than anybody else. Like right. I get the ball. Where's Steph? Where's Clay? Like right. I don't care what you are. It's coming right back. Right. Because, you know, it's kind of like the, uh, the stock market. It always corrects itself. Right. And <laughs> Right. They shoot a high clip, and that's like normal, so it's going to correct to come back to a high clip. Yeah. Well, that thing that you said about, um, you know, remembering stuff that from two years ago, that kind of reminds me of what people like so much about your game. Mm -hmm. You talked about this a little bit in the book, um, especially when you moved to the six-man role, that part of what you learned in that role was that you were to come off the bench and understand the flow of the game. Mm -hmm. And you talked a lot about how each game is different. There's a different flow to it. What's happening? How are people moving? Not just X's and O's, how are people being defended, but what is the vibe and flow of it? And I guess I just I want to hear you talk a little bit about what that experience is like for you to come into a game and get a read on what happened, what's happening. Right, so most six men come in, um, like Lou Williams, um, where he comes in and just go to work, you know, in terms of, you know, the ball's in your hands, and we're looking for you to score 20 some points off the bench, which is a tough thing to do. You got some of the best six men uh, NBA history. Uh, I think Dedler Shrimp might have been in that role for a high second. Tony Ku coach, um, Jamal Crawford, uh, Lou Williams, um, Eric Gordon did it for a hot second. Uh, forgetting a few other guys, but your role is to come in and <laughs> shoot, right? So my role uh, was a little different and I had to, you know, adjust on the fly and figure out what that meant. And that meant just paying attention to, you know, the subtleties of the game, whether it be, okay, Clay's got a certain bounce in his step. Like, I know that, I know, that, I know, I know Clay's bounce. Mm. He's got this bounce, right? And I'm like, oh, okay, he's, he's got it. Mm -hmm. And uh, always in L.A. too. He's got that bounce in L.A. all the time. <laughs> or against certain players. Yeah. He plays against certain guys. I know, you know Clay, Clay's got that bounce. Right. Um, and then with, with Steph, I'm watching him too to see – because sometimes Steph comes out and he's firing right away or he's going to let the game come to him and figuring mm -hmm. that thing out too. Uh, Draymond, he makes his first shot. I'm like, okay, cool. He's, he's, he's in the, he, you know, I know where he's thinking right now. So you're just watching your teammates, uh, see, seeing where they're at. And, and that allows me to figure out what my role is mm -hmm. on the fly. Mm -hmm. So I, it took me a while to figure it out. But once I figured it out, I've, I've learned to embrace it and uh, I've maximized it. So I know when to come out and attack or versus knowing when to just – let them do their things and stay out their way. I, I spoke about it earlier today. Um, sometimes getting out the way is the right and the most effective play. Right. And when you're in professional sports and there's that ego and that pride and there's me, 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 and I want to show that I'm helping out, you tend to get in the way and then, you know, it's in the clash with everyone else and it doesn't flow as well as it should and nobody can figure it out. And I think the question I was asking in the interview earlier was um, parts of the game that analytics can't mm. read or it doesn't show up when you're mm -hmm. in advanced analytics. And that's part of the game that will never show up on a stat sheet. It will never show up in advanced analytics. But just knowing how sometimes getting out the way is uh, the perfect play. Mm. You, um, you know, it seems to me from knowing about your childhood, your background, that a lot of that lack of ego in the sports area comes from the way you were raised mm -hmm. and where you fit into your family and just the experience you had. Can you tell us a little bit about what, your, what, what it was like for you growing up? Well, we had a big family in terms of um, from my grandmother. Uh, she had a foster and uh, she had a foster home and she adopted a few kids uh, as well. And then um, she had like eight kids, you know, half were in Kansas City, Missouri, and the other half was in Springfield, Illinois. So, we had a lot of family gatherings uh, at my grandmother's house, and at one point I was staying in the apartment upstairs. So it was always 10 to 15 people around, like just constantly. So uh, you learn to be able to get along with others. You learn to fend for yourself at times. Uh, you learn to, uh, we talked about this a little bit. Um, we had a huge edit in the book, but we had a, um, Cracking jokes are really good for you as a kid. Like, for some, I always tell my son, like, you gotta learn how to crack jokes on people, and mm -hmm. then you gotta learn how to be able to receive jokes. Yeah. <laughs> Those are humbling experiences, but it keeps you on, like, it keeps you on par. Uh -huh. You know, uh, it, it keeps you aware. Yeah. And, like, I have a certain awareness on the court. I can notice something about a guy because the younger it was like, I couldn't figure out how to crack jokes on people. 
And they go crack jokes in my ear. All the, they say I had big ears, call me Dumbo all the time. <laughs> I didn't have any jokes come back, but um, my stepbrother, uh, when we became roommates, uh, he was like, man, you got to pay attention. Like, look at his shoes. Look at his shirt. <laughs> look, man, his hat too big. Like, so I was like, oh, I get it now. So uh, it's funny because I've been able to take that. Like I just, I just yeah. explained about, I can see, I know Clay's bounce in a step. Yeah. Yeah. I know Steph, when he yeah. has a certain look. I got that from cracking jokes on right. people. <laughs> right. Yeah, um, also, growing up, you know, a lot of uh, players were always the best wherever they went, and that was their experience. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it, you know, it's a little bit of a wake up call when they get to a certain level and they're no longer the best. They're, you know, they're one of the best from everywhere else. But that wasn't your experience growing up. You didn't, you, you didn't, you weren't the star of every team that you played on growing up. Is that? Yeah, so I was a star up until a certain point, uh, which was around, when you hit around high school, um, you know, there's some big boys. Mm. So I kind of had to work my way up, and I had, a, I had this really big growth spurt from my freshman to sophomore year of high school. And even then, no one really knew the talent I quite had. And we had a, uh, a phenom a year younger than me who was nationally ranked. Uh, Started on a varsity team as a freshman. Uh, I mean, he was getting recruited by D1 schools in the eighth grade. You know, he was getting letters. So I wasn't quite at that level yet. Actually, I was better at track and field, which I thought I was gonna go to college for that. Um, but that was a, it was best for me. Like that was a really good pocket for me to be in because I was able to watch him from afar, start working out with him. Um, I fully really fell in love with the game around that time. We were just playing basketball every day. It was pure mm. and that was, um, it was a humbling experience as well because it's like, all right, now I see the, where I can go, how much better I can get. Like, what is he doing that I can do? And we, we built a, a very strong relationship, very strong bond. We still have to this day. And um, that, that was a good time for me um, to go through, you know, to kind of figure out where I fit in. I always talk about how important confidence is in the NBA, and your confidence can waver on a daily basis. And it's a fine line. You know, there's guys who you've never heard of who could be superstars in the league, but if you get in the wrong system, a coach might not have as much confidence in you, so you don't have the confidence in yourself, you'll never reach your maximum potential. Around that time, I was figuring out my confidence because I didn't quite know how good I was. So in turn, the coach didn't know how good I was. And mm -hmm. it took me to follow the footsteps of a guy who was younger than me, mm -hmm. and I didn't have an issue with that. Mm -hmm. He was on the national um, traveling team, and then I – get a minute here, two minutes there, slowly but surely I'm figuring out, I'm like, oh, I'm, you start figuring out like, okay, I'm just as good as him in this area. Yeah. I'm just as good in this area. Oh, I'm not, I'm okay, I'm pretty good. And then you go back home, you work on it, you gain some confidence and mm -hmm. you're practicing on the people back home because you're better than them. <laughs> and then they, that, that was that whole summer before my senior year where I just kept rising the rankings because I was doing things that I had this whole time. I didn't realize that yeah. Uh, I didn't realize I had them, and then they just start slowly but surely coming out. Mm. How do you balance the need to have confidence? You talk a lot about this in the book. In some ways, this is probably the biggest thing I learned mm -hmm. from you working on the book with you was the, the, the way in which we have to develop confidence and the way in which we, the specific ways in which we use confidence mm -hmm. to navigate through difficult situations. How do you balance that with the need for humility? Because they seem like they're opposites. How do you navigate your way through that? So I, I can go back to one point in uh, Chapel. We, were, we have Chapel before every game in uh, every arena, and we were in Chapel, and we were talking about uh, being humble, being selfless, and what that means. And he was like, what are you guys struggling with? And I said, I'm struggling with, you know, being humble and the humility side of things. But at the same time, and when I play my best, I'm trying to, I feel like I'm better than everybody. And that's that confidence. Like, I felt it in game six in the finals, like, I'm better than everybody out here. Right. And you go out there and you feel like you can do anything. But more so, than anything, more so than that, you have to know the work you put in. Like I said before, only you know if you worked hard. Only you know if you've uh, been in the gym countless hours working on your jump shot. Only you know you actually work on. You're one of the few that work on defensive drills. Only you know your attentions and everything you do within your profession. You try to do it to perfection and you try to do it with good intentions, not only for yourself, but only for your teammates. So I always try to take that approach. So I know that I'm working really hard, and, but at the same time, you're trying to 
be humble about it. And I asked the, the chaplain, like, sometimes I go back and watch my old film. Like, when I'm in a rut, I just go to YouTube, type in my name, look up. <laughs> no, I, like, I really need this sometimes. Like, it's, it's, like, I need it. So I'm like, oh, I, I, you can go find YouTube clips. I think it's like a Phoenix Suns game and a Lakers game. It's a couple games where I, like, I didn't miss. Yeah. And I'll just watch those games, and I'm like, okay. And then I go to the gym the next day. I find that rhythm again. And I'm mm. like, Jay-Z said it in one of his songs. It's like, sometimes you need your ego. You got to remind people, like, who you are. Because sometimes they take you too lightly. Yet you got to remind them, like, you know, don't take it too lightly. Like, I'm right. really good at this. Right. So, but, but it's that balance. And I was like, how do I find that balance? Like, sometimes I feel bad. Like, am, am, is, is there something wrong with watching myself? Mm -hmm. And he was like, it was like, it's the balance of your profession and your sport. And I'm doing it with good intentions. I'm right. doing it to help the team win, so on for, so forth. So like you said, it's all about having a good balance. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I relate to that. I, I, I sometimes I have to go back and read things I wrote Yes. to remind myself that I actually know how to write. Because yes. I'll be looking at a blank page <laughs> and I'll be like, yes. I literally, I forgot, how do you write again? Yes. Like Googling, how do you write an article? Um, <laughs> That's and, a great point. <laughs> and I have to go back and read stuff and be like, okay, I'm actually, I'm good at this, I can do this. Um, but, I, but Still, I, I just, I wonder about, um, I think there's not only in the game, not only in life, I mean, in, not only in the game, but also in life, mm -hmm. there's a certain, you, you, you run up against challenges, people that don't want you to succeed, people that doubt you. And, um, and I wonder how being an athlete has helped you in other areas of uh, your life. So this is something like I preach in the home to like all my children. It's three, it's three kids, and more so on a boy because he's a boy, and then the others are girls, so they'll be spoiled for the rest of their lives. So <laughs> they don't have to do anything. But uh, I always try to say, <laughs> I always try to say like, if you if you work really hard, you learn how to work hard. Life is easy huh. in terms of getting something done. So as a professional athlete, you have to beat out so many people. And I've gone through times where I've shot myself into, like, a dizziness, mm -hmm. where I shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot, and the body kind of got a little, things got a little fuzzy. I had to sit down and to do this. I, I remember doing this many a times, like, ah, just hold on, drink some water. It's like, all right, you can't stop. You got to keep going. You got to keep going. And then once you start seeing the benefits of it, once you start having, you know, individual or team success, you're like, man, that's just what it took. And then you're watching other guys you look up to admire doing the same thing. And then you're mentioning in the same breath as them. You're like, oh, you're doing This is what you're supposed to do. This is just work. And now it's not working hard anymore. It's just your daily routine. You know, it's just the discipline of it. But once you figure that out, you can put that same energy into anything else. You apply that same energy to anything else, and you can have success. You know, it's almost like the Matrix. You know, you just plug it in, and it just goes in your brain. I, like, I apply that to anything else. If I really want to be good at it, I'll just take myself into that mode of being on the basketball court and sh making 500 makes twice a day, and then I just apply it to that. And You know, you, got the, you know what your capacities are. You just go out and get it. So that's such an interesting thing. Um, why do you think more people don't do that? If really all it takes is just to apply, you know, like, just work really hard. Why do you think most people don't do that? It's hard. <laughs> I mean, because I, I tell my son all the time, it's like if, any, if everybody could do it, they would do it. But hard work is something that very few people want to do. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I wouldn't say uh, people work hard, and I think a lot of people work hard, especially those that are just trying to find the next meal. Like, that's right. a different type of work hard. Right. Right. But I always say once you learn how to sacrifice time, I should say that. Mm. You, learn how to sac you learn how to prioritize. Mm. So instead of being on your phone or it's like, a, it's like I used to have to do homework. Fear is the beginning of wisdom, right? I've been saying that all week, right? So it's fear is the beginning of wisdom. Fear is the beginning of wisdom. Close, close friend of mine <laughs> from back home. Uh, it's actually funny. Street guy turned into like he's an ordained minister now. Like mm. incredible human being. Like it's my good friend. Close friend. He came from like the projects from like nothing. Like mm. from nothing. And he knows the Bible inside out. He said, fear is the beginning of wisdom. Oh. And you need fear sometimes. So I was so afraid of my mom <laughs> that I had no choice but to sit there and get the homework done. <laughs> right? But once, you learn, like, once I learned how to like, read so many pages in a certain amount of time or get some homework done before the deadline, that stuff just got ingrained in me in an early age oh. to where like, 
that stuff I didn't want to do yeah. that I actually excelled at. Yeah. So like I said, like, I know how to focus. Focusing yeah. is really hard. Like, focus is yeah. it's not easy to focus. And, and there's a lot of kids. I know how you are. Like, that is a task in itself to just sit down. <laughs> Don't move for uh-huh. two minutes. But um, <laughs> there's a discipline in that, you know. And then I do yoga now. Uh, I meditate. And... I find myself, when I get in those rhythms where I'm just at present and I can focus and be intent with everything that I'm doing, that's when I'm most productive. You but that's really hard. Right. Like, that's hard. Right. You mentioned that you were motivated by a fear of your mother when you were younger. What, do you, what are you afraid of now? Oh, um, uh, my business partner, Rudy, he's afraid that I'm not I'm afraid, afraid of, of Rudy too, he, huh? No, no. <laughs> he's afraid that I'm not afraid of anything now. Uh. <laughs> So he's like, you'll say anything, uh-huh. you'll say what you think, you just express yourself. You're not afraid of anything because it's like once you, once you start getting a grand understanding of just life in itself or the way the world works, then, you know, you're, I'm at peace because I've, I've been able to go work hard. I've, I've, I've had an intent with what I'm doing. Um, I know my attentions are pure. Like, I, I, I don't want to see anybody fail. I don't want to do any harm to anyone. The people that look like me, I want them to come up in a better situation mm. that I'm in and leave the world in a better place. So I'm just good with like, man, like my son is like, he acts just like me and it's like, he's smart. Like he, school comes easy to him and you know, he can crack a joke on me now. So like, I'm doing something right. <laughs> like, you know, I just try to go about life and it's like, you know, if I see something, I'll address it. And, um, I've really got into my, my spirituality or my faith. Yeah. So I'm just really at peace, like, as long as I take each day trying to become better and better every day, then, I mean, what else is there to do but to do that, you know, whether it's reading or uh, giving back information or taking care of uh, my young teammates and making sure they're mm-hmm. on the right track. That's, I get the most joy out of that. Yeah. Like, when I look back in five years and the guy's still in the league, who's not supposed to be in the league, I'm like, okay, you did it right. You know, you're really not supposed to be here. You know, mm-hmm. you weren't, and that's not a bad thing. It's like, it's a guy that's on the cusp. He's on that edge. Mm-hmm. And it's like, if you're on that edge, you got to do the little things right. You know, you got to be early. Mm-hmm. You got to be late. You got to be respectful to everybody. You know, there's no ego there. Mm-hmm. You got to work really hard. And then, you know, there's really no vacations. So when you see those guys, it's like, he listen. He's still here. Like that's when I get joy out of seeing. Mm. Well, you, we've had some some of the most interesting conversations we had. I thought when we were working on the book are about success. Mm-hmm. And you said something, and I and I wonder if you still feel this way. This was maybe like a year or so ago. I asked you if you felt successful, and you really had to stop and think about it. And it didn't seem to me that you were sure that the answer mm-hmm. was yes. Can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, do you feel successful in this moment? And if, what does that mean for you? Yeah, success is, is one of those things that um, I'm still trying to figure out. Mm. Um, I guess maximizing yourself, I guess you can say that, because we define success in the wrong ways. You know, we define success in, in uh, vanity and money and material things and um, our desires. But that's, we, once you get those things, you realize, like, no, this isn't success at all. Like, I try to explain to people, like, money isn't really all it's cracked up to be. You know, it, it puts you in a, in a more comfortable situation where you don't have certain worries, mm-hmm. but it's a whole nother bucket of problems that most people can't deal with or don't want to. Like, it's, it's kind of crazy. So success is one of those things, especially being in America, being in a capitalist system where success is supposed to be found in, you know, uh, in a currency. Uh, that's not it. So I guess I have to find to define it in a certain way where um hopefully uh i am but i still got a long way to go in life and Mm -hmm. people have different paths so Mm -hmm. one person's success may not be another person's success Mm -hmm. so i still have goals and still have a ways to go before i feel like oh it was a successful life but i still got work to do Mm -hmm. you i guess i'm curious about what motivates you to keep trying new things Mm -hmm. like a lot of people would be like, this is great, I've had a successful career, I've made good money, mm-hmm. people are taken care of, why write a book? Why do tech stuff? Why, why do all this other stuff? 
So I think, it's, I think it started, that, that's a really good question. That started at like a young age of wanting to separate myself, mm -hmm. right? Especially looking the way I look. So I've had many situations where teachers be like, I had a teacher tell me, you're never gonna make it, you're gonna be a loser. Or I had another teacher I talk about in a book who was like, you're in the wrong class. Like, this isn't the class you're supposed to be in because I was the only black kid. It was one other black kid, but I look like a black kid. It's because so you were in the advanced class. It was the advanced <laughs> English class. Yeah. Was, she was like, wait, where are you going? I'm like, I'm going to class. And so imagine being 12 years old and the teacher's like, you're in the wrong room. I'm like, I know where I'm going. I can read. The, the, <laughs> 206 is the room I'm in. She was like, nah, you're not in. I'm like, what am I supposed to do? I'm just standing there like my mother taught me respect. I came disrespectfully. I'm like, what, what, what are we going to do now? Am I going to stand here? Mm. We're just going to wait it out? Like, and she's like, let me see your schedule. Here's my schedule. Oh, you are in here. But then I, this is when I'm learning my environment and how people see me. And I'm like, she's giving me the side eye all the time. Mm. And I'm not her favorite. And the first essay, I write the essay. I found the best essay out of the class. It's written by Andre. I'm her favorite student the rest of the year. Yeah. <laughs> right? But it's just that perception thing, and, and I lost track of where I was going. Well, you were answering why, what motivates you to do all this other oh. stuff. Oh, so yeah, so from a young age, I just wanted to set myself apart from everybody. So, like, that's just being me being a competitor. Yeah. So, I wanted to win every sprint. Yeah. I wanted to score the most points, I wanted to get the most rebounds. Yeah. Like, you know, you kids are like that with Fortnite. Like, you go crazy when you lose. <laughs> that, I was just like that with everything that I did. I wanted, to be the, I wanted to be the fastest reader. So that's still in me to this day where I want to do something so different and I want to excel at it so much. So I, I try to find the hardest thing, and I'm like, okay, whatever's the hardest thing, I'm going to tackle that. So writing a book is something that isn't done too often, especially, I think, the way I did it. Mm. You know, it wasn't a tell-all. Yeah. You know, it was basically me. I took all the blame for everything. Yeah. And I don't think anyone expressed themselves. So, I, you know, what's the hard way? And let's do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, I think the, you, you benefit more from the hard way, too. You know, there's more benefit. Do you fear failure at all? And, and, and what is your relationship to failure? Do you ever feel like when things don't go the way? I always tell my kid, there's, there's no good and bad. There's just what you would prefer and what you wouldn't prefer, mm -hmm. you know? But I think sometimes we still believe that if things don't go the way we want, that's a failure. Mm -hmm. And then failure hurts, it's uncomfortable, and so consequently we avoid it. What is your relationship to things not going the way you want? I wouldn't call it failure. Mm -hmm. uh, I know I used to be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Like when I made a mistake and I had to address it, I had to fix it, I was a little uncomfortable. Like you kind of fight it or push it, push it off, like I'll do it later, I'll do it. You're procrastinating with it, You're, I'll get it later. Now when I make mistakes, I'm like, cool, this is a new area for me. Like, let me just tackle it. Let me see what this feels like. Oh. I, I, my only thing, failure, is when you just don't try. So I don't even, I don't even associate myself with that word. Like, failure is like, oh, what is failure? Like, anything I see, I'm going to go get it. Like, I'll even, I'll even eat any food now. Like, I'll just try. <laughs> like, I just had some, uh, in New York, I just had some snails. <laughs> And then before, I'd be like, I'm not eating that. But now it's just like, just, just go get it. Just explore. And as mm -hmm. long as you're exploring, as long as you're trying something, there's no such thing as, as failure. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's. <laughs> we're going to open up the floor to questions in a little bit. But I, I, don't, I don't think it's you know, out of pocket to suggest that you're coming to the end of your basketball career. And um, I wonder, when you look back on it, what is the feeling that you have when you look back at what your experience in the league? Um, that's a good question. Like, and I think Steph spoke on it. Like, last year was just a rough year. So mm -hmm. it was just so heavy that at times you, you were, I would ask myself, like, how much time I got left? Like, oh, I, I don't I have so many things that I want to get to that I'm anxious to get to that I'm like, ah, I'll just, you know, I'll hang them up in a year or so. Maybe next year I'm done. But I had, I had a really good year and I was I had a very healthy year. Yeah. And it's like, man, you got a lot of time. And <laughs> um, like as of right now, and the way the season end, and I was like, everyone was at peace with the way the season ended up with our team. Like we're, we've been able to relax. I think we're going to be really excited about next year, like more so excited than any other time because of just the way things occurred, uh, you know, with our guys. And like right, right now, I'm feeling like I can't wait to get back in the gym. So I'm really excited <laughs> for it. But um, 
I'm going to just take that like day by day, year by year in terms of how long do I want to play. I got like four or five left. I don't, I don't know how I'm, I've been able to hold up the way I have. We got some really good trainers. They've done an amazing job. I've always had a close relationship with our trainers, so I'm always in the gym, but uh, I got a lot of time left. My last question for you before we open up the, to the floor is, uh, what do you want to leave behind as, I want to say legacy, because that's kind of a bankrupt word, mm -hmm. people overuse it and misuse it, but what do you want the impact of your life to be on the world? Oh, well, I mean, you know, having three kids, you want them to, um, you want them to go after their passions, mm -hmm. no matter what it may be. So, like, my son doesn't have to play basketball. I prefer him to play golf. <laughs> but, um, but, but watching him um, and then watching my two girls is like, just go after your passions. And he, and he likes basketball. He, he, if, he can maximize, if he maximizes his talents, he'll play in the NBA. Like, it's easy. So um, I shouldn't say easy. <laughs> but he's been put in an environment where he's, he's access to it. He's a really cerebral player. He's very smart. And he can shoot. So, I mean, a lot of guys don't have both those things. So. Uh, if he if he maximizes himself, and it sounds easy, but young fella, you got to work hard. Like, you know what it, you know what I'm saying, but you got all the tools. You just put the work in. It's, I, like I say, hard work is easy. I like hard work, so that just <laughs> became easy to me. So once you learn how to work hard, you got it. Um, but with my kids, I want them to chase their passions um, and just experience life. I went through all the little hard things just to kind of clear all that out for them, so they can just go do what they do. Uh, but I think in terms of being a professional athlete who has a sense of self and who isn't afraid to uh, go against uh, the big machine that can alter uh, the way we go about life. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the machine uh, keeps us from being at peace because we just chase and chase and chase and chase and chase and chase, and chase mm -hmm. instead of taking time to reflect sometimes or just accepting like if you don't win a championship that doesn't mean you are a failure you know that's a big thing in sports it's like we define people by um, our emotions that are attached to the game so if you know if I'm a fan in Denver and this is great athlete and it's like well if you're that good you should be winning three championships I need to feel I need to feel that because I'm a big fan. So if you don't get me three championships, then you're a failure because you didn't live up to what I needed you to be. Mm -hmm. There's a big part of that in the game as well. So I just want athletes to get a better sense of that and that mental space. Like we talked about, it's getting harder and harder for athletes to be at peace because of all the things that are surrounded by the game. It's not the game. We're at peace when we're on the court. Mm -hmm. It's just when we step away, you get an interview. Why did you do this? Why did you do that? Why did you lose? Or uh, is he better than you? Or are you better than this person? So you're really just, you're battling with yourself when you're doing all these things and then you're on social media trying to build a brand or you're trying to um, get an endorsement deal. Or like, you know, sometimes it's like, just take a step away. Mm. You know, it's, people call Kyrie Irving crazy, but he's a genius to me. Mm. You know, just the way he perceives things. You know, I don't agree with everything he says, but, um, <laughs> He's, uh, you can tell there's a soul there, mm. and he's trying to be better and better every day. So I just want all athletes to be at peace with, because what they, what we, sometimes we don't realize is understand where these guys come from. And it's like, it was a miracle just to get out of where they came from. Like, mm. they're supposed to be dead like 20 years ago. Mm. Like, I grew up kind of like that. Like, you know, my brother's best friend got shot in the head. My brother was this close to him. Like, imagine that trauma, like, you know, like, Sometimes there's a disconnect between the fans because the fans that we see around us on the court aren't from where we come from. Mm -hmm. So um, I want to put that human element mm. back into sports because when you put the big business and, and, and you look at the business side, it kind of separates the two. Is there the house like <clears throat> Okay, we're going to bring up the house lights for questions, and we have, uh, I think, two roving microphones in the house. We have one over here on your right. Okay. Hi. 
Andre, I'm Zoe Taylor. Um, you told Jeff Murray of Forbes when asked about athletes, um, what they have to offer to the tech world, and you said that 100% of athletes have their grind. Could you talk a little bit about your grind um, when you first came into the league and even early beginnings in basketball that led you to where you are today? And then I have a l other question, is if I could get a picture with you. <laughs> <laughs> I like the way you snuck that in. Um, <laughs> well, in terms of when you first came, like the game's so much, the game's so different in terms of the branding off the court now. When you first got in the league, uh, it was like just building molds of like the same thing over and over. And there's still pieces of it, but not as much. So, you know, you drove a certain car, you dressed a certain way, you had even a certain particular watch. Um, you just did certain things. You get on a plane, you did this thing. And when you did, when you did it, endorsement deals, like if you signed with a shoe company, everyone had a shoe contract. Um, they were all the exact same, just take off the name. So it was just cookie cutter. And that was the mentality of how to go about your brand. And Michael Jordan was at the forefront of that because he was so dynamic and he had such a following that everyone on the outside wanted to take advantage of that. So you had a lot of sports agents saying, you know, that's the way you got to do it. So everything was like monotonous with how you do things. Like, you know, in two years, we're gonna be here, in two years, you get married, in two years, you have a kid, and then we're gonna set up the family thing, and it was like, <laughs> but tech is disruption, so I always talk about that, and um, now you're starting to see that with athletes are taking more ownership of their brand, they're more personalized, you know, they're aligning themselves with people who have the same values that they have, um, and from a business sense, so um, that's where I've come a long way, and. and figuring out my lane in my pocket, embracing that. And when I'm going to talk to other guys, it's not, you know, hey, do tech investments, but let learn the business, find your lane, find your niche, and, and, and take that and maximize it. Thank you. Next question here on your left, Andre, over here. Yes. Hey, Andre. Um, first off, thank you for speaking with us today. You're such a role model, and congratulations on the book. Thank you. Um, my question combines your love for sneakers with technology. At yesterday's Players Technology Summit, there was a session with HB titled, Is It the Shoes? And on Wednesday, StockX raised a 110 million Series C, valuing the company north of a billion. Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts on today's sneaker game? Do you see a future where AI, machine learning, could create perfect bespoke speakers, or shoes, sorry, by learning style of play? And lastly, shooting my shot here, something I think you would appreciate. Is there any chance I can have your autograph on this Run the One <laughs> PE that you wore back in 2015? <laughs> he's, he's, he's probably going to sell that. I'm joking. <laughs> um, great question. So, yeah, I've been in sneakers, and we just talked, I just talked about Michael Jordan in terms of how he changed the culture of shoes and, you know, what's Nike's market cap? Like, some crazy number, right? So, um, their market cap is leading in footwear, and I actually did a... Uh, panel yesterday on uh, the new work shoe with Allbirds, who is valued at $100 billion as well. Startup I was able to invest in um, and how those worlds either clash or stay separate. And I'll say this, um, Nike has a new shoe with like computerizing inside, self-lacing self system. It's uh, in a basketball shoe, yeah. And then Adidas is doing 3D printing soles. And what I've been able to learn is the sole is the most expensive part of the shoe, and that's what, where Allbirds has been able to capitalize on. They've been able to make a sole uh, more sustainable, uh, more friendly on the ecosystem, and um, that's why they're able to sell it at $95. And that's why a lot of people in the Valley uh, really, they really enjoy the shoe and wear the shoe, plus it's comfortable. Um, so that space is going to continue to rise. Um, what you saw was athletes were at the forefront of influence of shoes, but I think now you're starting to see more of a personalization of who you are as a person. You don't have to be an athlete to make a pair of shoes look cool. Now you're seeing entertainers get into the space. Of course, Kanye West has a huge following. He has a huge deal. He used to be with Nike, now he was with Adidas, and he's getting royalties off that. Um, but it's not about you have to run fast or jump high now. It's just being who you are, being embraceful. And um, it doesn't have to be a basketball shoe, but it's sneakers, so it's going to continue. And then you talk about um, design, fashion, and uh, African-American culture leading the way. you got a lot of ball players at um, all the fashion weeks, 
in Paris last week and then there at the men's and uh, the, uh, the Met Gala. You see a lot of influencers there as well. So that space is going to continue to, to, to have uh, big influences on consumers. Question over here to your right. Hey, Andre. Yes, how you doing? Uh, so I'm curious, you talked a lot tonight about successes and failures, you know, the good and the bad. I'm curious, in, in your life experience, in your basketball experience, have the good always outweighed the bad? In my life experiences, uh, have the good outweighed the bad? I've learned to, uh, yeah, I'd probably say it's been more good than bad, but I always remember the bad, and I try to, <laughs> I try to embrace the bad. Like, I don't know why, but sometimes I seek pain, or I just seek the hard way because, you know, I, I, I just resonate with something. I have an obstacle and it's really hard and I overcome it. And, and uh, I don't know, there's that, uh, there's that weird thing with me chasing after something that's, that's difficult for me. Um, like I do Ken Ken puzzles and Sudoku puzzles all day long <laughs> until my brain hurts. So there's just something, there's just something with finding um, an obstacle and overcoming it. I mean, it, I, it seems like you, a person can't be a professional athlete without having some weird thing in them that chases pain. Yes. <laughs> I, I read an article on Michael Jordan when he turned 50, I think. Uh, it was this long article, and uh, it kind of scared me because he said um, it, it was some others mentioning, you know, we're afraid for Michael because he was so, he enjoyed being the man and the superstar for so long, and he can't chase that anymore, and he mm. can't get it through being the owner. It was like, you know, he's had suicidal thoughts. Mm. Like, what's the point of living? Like. I live what I wanted to do. Like, what's the point going forward? Mm. That would kind of scare me, but uh, that's the mental, as mental health right. aspect of it and doing right. the right things to keep yourself in. And, and, and he plays golf a lot, too. Uh, <laughs> if he get, probably if he, get, if he got better at golf, he would be... He would be <laughs> no, he's better than me. So, but hopefully I don't, I'm not stuck at where he is for so long. <laughs> Next question here on your left. No, he ain't talking. I know him. <laughs> Hi, Andre. Thanks for being here, and thanks for everything you've done with the dubs. Thank you. I've spent a lot of time watching you. And one of the most poignant moments of the finals was uh, when you, Myers, and Steph walked KD off the court in the middle of a game. Can you tell us how, what that felt like for you? Um, I just, I even forgot I was just in the finals. Uh, I, that just left. Like, <laughs> once something like that happens to somebody you love, like, nothing else really matters. Mm. Like, I didn't even, because sometimes people do stuff like that because the cameras are on. Like, I just left. Like, my, my, my brain left that arena, left the finals. And uh, that one hurt me a little bit. Uh, Clay's hurt me. Clay's hurt me pretty bad, too. Like, that one was, like, worse than having somebody close to you. Uh, pass. It was just like, you know, these guys really take care of themselves. They really take care of the game. And it happens in sports, and everything happens for a reason, so it was supposed to happen. You just hate to see it happen to them. So uh, those are the moments you let those guys know, like, look, it's bigger than the game. Like, I don't care about the game. I just want to make sure you're good. You're going to be in a good headspace. And going forward, I'm here to support you. Did you believe Drake in that? Question all the way, oh, sorry. Question all the way on top? Yes. Hi, so um, you killed it when you earned the finals MVP. Um, Thank you. Defending against LeBron. And <laughs> I, was I was super excited to come tonight, so I put it up on Facebook. And then a friend said, did you hear what he said about his daughter playing basketball? And so I wanted to just, I was really devastated and I wanted to give an opportunity to, to hear context for that statement. And mm -hmm. I know I have several LGBT friends who are mm -hmm. also involved, you know, who are also Christian. And you've mm -hmm. been in the Bay Area for a while. This comment was made several years ago. So I just wondered if your feelings have changed and if you could provide some context. Yes, yeah, so, so the statement was uh, not by me. It was a question. Um, it was a speculation. Um, if anybody's ever been in a uh, deposition, people just throw things out or speculate. So uh, I have a daughter who's 10, and uh, the 
the statement was, do you want your daughter to play basketball? I said, no, I don't want her to play basketball. And it's because women are a certain way. And it's like, it has nothing to do with that. Um, I just said I want my, I'd rather have my son play golf just now than basketball. I just understand um, what comes with basketball. Um, I have a philosophy on injuries in basketball, especially with women. So I'm just overprotective of that, especially with my daughters and uh, even with my son. Um, but that was never the case in terms of sexuality being in any way uh, part of the reason that that was the case. So that's been, my, that's been another issue that I've had with sports is that, you know, you have a whole conversation and you have a whole context of what you're trying to say and then one sentence within a 30 minute conversation is highlighted and said, this is what he said, and that wasn't the case. So hopefully I can clear that up and say that um, that wasn't the case at all. Thank you. We've got time for just two more questions. Over here to your right. Hi, Andre. How you doing? Hi, how are you? I'm Carnetta. I have two part question for you. Yes. One, I'm really looking forward to reading your book. Thank you. I'm wondering what inspired you to write your memoir. You're such a young man right now, uh, at your age now. I'm wondering what inspired you to write your book now. Mm -hmm. And two, what did you see in the Warriors um, as a Denver uh, player for Denver when we played you in the... Um, um, 2014 uh, playoffs. I forget what the playoffs, yes. right. And you saw something in our team that inspired you to want to join the dubs. I'm wondering what that was for you. Yeah, so the first part, um, what inspired me to write the book, um, it was just an idea that sparked, um, you know, me and my family, business partner, uh, my whole team, we throw different ideas out there from time to time. And um, I'm a huge reader and uh, we were just looking at like a lot of biographies and uh, I remember I read Marcus Samuelson. I read uh, Manny Rivera, a picture from the Yankees. Um, it was if Robin Roberts was in there. Uh, I just read Warren Buffett's Snowball Effect. That was one of my favorite books. Uh, it took me about a year to read that. But <laughs> um, I just felt like I accomplished enough to tell my story. And what I didn't want to do was make it a story about the Warriors more so using the success of the Warriors to be able to tell my story. So I felt like it was perfect timing, the things I've been doing on, the, on and off the court, that uh, it was good timing on the first, on the, on the, and I guess you would say if there was, a, there may be a trilogy. So I, um, <laughs> I've actually been working on what's next in terms of uh, publishing something. Um, so the next one I'm really excited about uh, in terms of my views on leadership you know, I read about John Wooden. I read Pat Bradley's book was really good, and obviously Phil Jackson has a lot of things that he's written, so I've seen all those things, and um, Steve might write something, we'll see. Or right, Coach Olsen had a book as well. So um, that was the inspiration behind that, and then uh, in terms of coming to the Warriors, uh, I really just saw, like I said before, I saw a team of guys who really just enjoy playing basketball, and you know, I played in Philly, and then it was spent a short period just playing for the wrong reasons, which I said earlier is trying to prove people wrong, like just trying to prove people wrong. And then being in Denver, you had a lot of moving pieces. The GM left, the coach left. And um, I said, the next place I'm going to go play, I'm going to make sure it's like I'm just going to play basketball and I'm just going to have fun. I don't have to worry about uh, the, what, what, your, what everyone's intentions around the team and organization are. It's just going to be purely about basketball. And I felt like that was the best play here. Thank you. Last question right here on your left. Unfortunately for me, one of my lasting memories of the finals was the um, embarrassing and unimaginably inappropriate actions of one of the Warriors investors to uh, Kyle Lowry. Yes. Um, even though um, I haven't played golf with you, um, I feel there's not a lot of people I'd ask this question of, but I feel I can ask it of you. If it wasn't Kyle Lowry, if it was uh, Paul, uh, Paul, uh, Marcus All, if it was a white guy that fell in his lap and he started cussing at him and hitting him, 
pushing them away. Do you think there'd be the same outcry from NBA players as there was? And more importantly to me, I guess, would you have viewed it any differently? That's a very good question. And I respect that because um, there is that side of it. And I think Kyle Culver had an interesting article that he wrote um, and he expressed, because he sees it a lot, or I shouldn't see a lot. Not a lot, but he has experienced it in Utah, and then there's kind of been a perception of how the players are viewed when we play in Utah. I even talk about it a little bit in the book. Um, but I do think the NBA is swift to make the right actions and not making it totally about race. Um, there are a lot of different sides to it. I do think the penalty would be the same. Um, but I will add, if our league was majority white, will we have the same issues in terms of a dress code being changed or will we have the um, marijuana perception if the league was all white? Because if you look at sports like hockey uh, and baseball, uh, different sports, they don't get tested for marijuana at all. Or, or I shouldn't say not at all, but their thresholds for their penetration in their body is a lot higher. Like, you, you, you can never fail the test, especially in hockey. Um, <laughs> no, but I'm not saying it that way. I, I will say this. They use it, they actually use it or encourage it, not marijuana, but CBD to ease their pains. And it's actually, it's, it's medicinal. Like, they actually use it to they have concussions and get their teeth knocked every night, out every night. So they actually use it as a benefit, but when we're using it, it's more of a stigma and how it's placed on us. So uh, I really think that's a really good question. That could be a discussion, but I do think probably the um, same thing would have happened. But you could ask the same question. If a white guy fell into the stands, would he, would have, would he have grabbed them and did that to him? Mm. Okay. Well, uh, I want to thank the JCC, and I want to thank you, Andre, for coming out tonight. Uh, thank you all. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you. Very happy. Thank you.